Ettore Arco Isidoro Bugatti was as extraordinary as his name might suggest. Although an ingenious and inventive engineer, he had little or no formal engineering training. He had a natural mechanical ability, which coupled with his intense powers of observation and artist's eye, was to produce some of the most aesthetically beautiful automobiles the world has ever seen. He had no technical training whatsoever. In fact, the whole of his, his life his design work is, is uh, characterized by a complete ignorance of scientific principles, although an astonishing ability to pick up what's good and uh, uh, choose solutions which work. Hugh Conway is an acknowledged expert on Ettore Bugatti and his creations. He spent his working life as a mechanical and aeronautical engineer, and for the last 30 years or so, he has owned and rebuilt many Bugattis. He's also written several highly regarded books on the subject. Most engineers believe that when you design something, it's probably not perfect the first time. Bugatti believed that what he said was right and didn't really want anybody to, to criticize it or even suggest modifications. His father was a splendid chap called Carlo Bugatti. The family was brought up and the parents lived in Milan, which is a part of Italy, uh, famous still is, for both for metalwork and for art. His father, Carlo, was an incredible designer of furniture, a rather bizarre type, but full of admirable craftsmanship using wood and a lot of parts from it for decoration and splendid metalwork. He had two sons. The elder was a Tory, and the younger son was born three years later, and they called him Rembrandt. He, in fact, turned out to be an astonishingly good sculptor, and his works are well known in the art world these days. He, he specialized in animals, what the French call an animalier. Unfortunately, he was a rather sad chap, and he died, took his own life in 1915, depressed by the, the war and the fact that he couldn't survive in his beloved Antwerp Zoo, where he did most of his work in his sculpting. But to go back to young Atori, he was supposed to be, being the elder, the one who was trained in art school. But he became much more interested in what you might call the mechanical arts of the period. And uh, he left his younger brother to be the fine artistic chap. At the time, he was a strange young man, a nice looking young chap, who affected odd costume. He was a bit, bit foppish, in fact. His costumes were almost as odd as some of his designs. The story has to start, really, with him joining a, a local bicycle firm and starting to race tricycles, which were built by this particular firm, by purchasing the Dion engines. The Dion engine was the easiest, most readily obtainable 
a single cylinder engine. And in fact, he converted a bicycle. We think it was similar to this, but we're not sure. He put an extra engine on it to make two. Before 1900, he was doing a lot of racing along the roads of northern Italy and uh, earned a reputation for being a bit of a daredevil. Then, by courtesy of two friends of his family, the Counts Giulianelli, he was enabled actually to start designing and building his own car. It was a four-cylinder, four-wheeled, chain-driven car with a proper gearbox and a, and a proper engine with at least one of the valves overhead. We're not sure of the detail. And this was exhibited at one of the engineering shows in Milan in 1901. This was when he was 20 years old. A great big famous German firm, De Dietrich, visited this exhibition and were much struck by this car and arranged to take a license to manufacture it. And the younger Tory goes off to Niederbrand to design. We're not sure of the, of the detailed arrangements, nor indeed, unfortunately, we've never been able to find out what happened to this first car. We know that he built a racing car because we've got photographs of this. Uh, that's extraordinary. It's a version, that we think, of the original car. But he put himself at the back to steer from the rear. And sitting beside him is one of his young friends, Mathis, whose name you'll hear later on. You'll find throughout the whole history of Ettore Bugatti uh, this curious uh, trick of doing things differently from other people. What I suppose some people nowadays call lateral thinking. That's a shot of the actual first chassis. It was really a splendid piece of engineering. It had a four-cylinder engine with four of the valves were, were pulled down to open them. They weren't pushed up as an ordinary car. They were pulled down by pull rods as opposed to push rods. It had the ordinary sort of cone clutch of the period. And then the gearbox was, was just behind, well, underneath the driver. In fact, he sat on top of it. And then there was the usual chain drive of the period because people in those days didn't have live back axles. They had this chain drive to the rear wheels. Well, that was quite successful. They didn't make a great deal of them, but here's a shot of, of the car with a body. It looked quite reasonable. And certainly, some of them worked rather well. We've got one or two letters still in existence from customers who extolled the virtues of the car. We also got uh, ac access to correspondence of people m grumbling about the unreliability. I think the real truth is that Bugatti was a, a sort of dilettante designer, very clever. But he didn't really spend a lot of time doing what we now call product development to get the bugs out of the, these early cars. And they must have had a lot of faults. When they worked, they probably worked very well. But they weren't necessarily very reliable. And certainly the arrangements with the Dietrich company suffered because he really did spend, as far as we can see, too much of his time racing. Anyway, he left Dietrich in 1904. There was a recession in the car world. They weren't selling very many. They found penetrating the, this difficult car world was too difficult. And they gave up and paid him off or got rid of him in some way or other. And he then set up with his friend Mathis and produced a rather elegant motor car and uh, made a few of these. There were still large cars. But uh, now, curious enough, instead of having both valves operated by pull rods, he operated one the inlet valve by a pull rod pulling it down, and the exhaust valves were pushed up by conventional push rods. You'll find in, the, in his early history, he tried really everything, actually. It still it was a nice car, it's a very similar in layout with the gearbox and the chain drivers before, and quite a good car, actually. That lasted for only two years, that arrangement with Mathis. They weren't able to commercialize the thing properly, although at least one came to England that was sold under the name Burlington. Then an interesting thing happened to Bugatti. There was a very fine and very well-known firm in Cologne, in Germany, called Deutz. And they decided they wanted to get into the car business. And they hired Ettore Bugatti in 1907 to design for them as a consulting designer, which was really quite a, a feather in his cap because it was a very fine firm. He produced two cars there. The first one was a splendid version of the same general layout as before, with the gearbox in the middle and the chain drive. But now the engine had overhead valves not operated by pull rods or, any, or even push rods, but by a central camshaft, an overhead camshaft, a very modern design, and sort of curved tappets shaped like bananas 
which from a single camshaft middle pushed the valves down to open them. That was a good design. And later he refined it again, the same engine, but now he put for the first time a proper shaft drive in it with uh, the layout that we see on the modern motor car with a gearbox here and the back axle of, of what is now more or less a conventional type. In fact, it was a modern design, in my judgment, a good design. And it's a pity that, um, as far as we know, none of, none of these cars exist. However, Deutz again had trouble penetrating a new market. They were very well known, very successful manufacturers, stationary engines, but even for a firm as able as that, it was not easy to penetrate into a new market. Now, a very interesting thing happened. While he was working for uh, Deutz, his arrangement enabled him to work as a consulting designer on his own, on the side, as it were. Well, he now decided to build a little car, what, the, what they called in those days a voiturette. He was probably stimulated by the Waterette racing in 1908, where there appeared a number of very lovely little cars, in particular, a very pretty little Isotta Vachini. He then produced, in his own home at uh, Cologne, a miniature version of the car he'd just done for Deutz. It was a four-cylinder baby car with a little gearbox and a sharp drive to the back axle, like the bigger Deutz version, only what you would call today 1200cc engine. A very light, uh, handled beautifully, uh, relatively fast. It would do in good condition, uh, well over 60 miles an hour, which was quite fast for those days. Certainly, the car created quite a sensation in its day, and it wasn't long before he was able to get some finance. He was probably by that time tired of working for other people. We may ask ourselves, how come Bugatti came to Molsheim? Well, the explanation is that he'd had a banking friend, a sporting friend of his, who lived in the Strasbourg area, Mr. Vizcaya, from the Spanish banking family, which still exists, incidentally. He knew of a disused dye works in this village of Molsheim and uh, recommended Bugatti to go and look at it. This was uh, the end of 1909. And Bugatti went there and bought the building, presumably with help from his banking friends in Strasbourg. Here we are standing uh, outside the building with the factory entrance behind us and the villa which became the residential property of Bugatti from 1909 until the end in 1939. The other buildings around it were used for the offices and the design office and the factory buildings inside were where he built his original cars. I have got here an interesting early picture, probably taken in 1910 or 1911, showing his original prototype, Pure Sang, as it was called, Thoroughbred, and an early Deutz car, which he probably kept for souvenir. And in the background, some of his workmen and a number of chassis being built. And almost certainly, one of these chassis here is one of the cars that we're going to see shortly belonging now to Mr. Peter Hampton in, in England. The engine design on this first little Bugatti car, which he did at his Molsheim factory, represents a style of design which Bugatti was to use more or less until the end, namely an aluminum crankcase, aluminum cast crankcase, bolted direct to the frame, on which is mounted a cylinder block, uh, usually four cylinders. When he had an eight-cylinder car, he would normally have two blocks in his early designs. And then on top of that, a cam box, as we call it, Catania camshaft, and means of operating the overhead valves. Bugatti was one of the first designers to use uh, overhead valves, and really he used this on all his designs from 1910 onwards. The drive to the camshaft was taken on the front of the engine by a vertical shaft with bevel gears, one on the crankshaft and the other on the camshaft. And then there was a cross drive for the magneto on one side and the, and the water pump on the other side. The interesting feature of this little car is in fact the Ettore Bugatti signature, which was his trademark. And in fact, it's the only model of his car where he was so bold as to use his own name on the cam box. 
This uh, early model 8-valve car didn't have the later oval-shaped radiator, or horseshoe shape, if you like, which became the Bugatti feature, which everybody almost recognized. But he only used this on the first three years of its production and went over to the oval radiator in 1913. The other feature which is worth stressing on this car is the, the balanced design. It's a lightweight car. He was very keen to reduce the weight. He used to argue, quite rightly, that weight was the enemy. And this is probably the first time that a car was neither a cycle car put together with bits of string and wire, or a heavy-duty car scaled down where some of the th sections, like the gears and whatnot, were of heavy duty, heavier than is needed. So that axle is all that you need for a car of this weight and, and performance. And other features of it, like the, the, the transmission, the back axle, and the gearbox are equally light, which helps to make the car extremely charming to drive. In his very first catalog, he quotes an article by the famous author of the time, W.F. Bradley, who said that he managed to pass a much heavier car on bad roads by virtue of the maneuverability and light handling of this little car.